All right, hello everyone and welcome to Black Minds Matter, a course where we seek to raise the national consciousness about issues facing black boys and men in education. Uh, we're pleased to, to have another session and today we'll be talking about a concept called ascription of intelligence. And so we have two guest speakers who will be joining us today, uh, Donna Ford and Fred Bonner, and they're going to share their wisdom with us as it relates to their work uh, focused on gifted learners. As always, we wanted to start by uh, thanking the partners who helped us in terms of, of ensuring that this course can be delivered. They include the Education Trust West, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, MOB, uh, which is Moms of Black Boys United. In fact, this past week, and uh, we were able to do a session for the, the MOB membership focused on some of the topics that are coming out of this course. So definitely check them out and look into the great work that they're doing. The San Diego State University Instructional Technology Services, Our Scholarship Matters, and then CORA, the Center for Organizational Responsibility and Advancement. Okay, so now that we've covered that material, we'd like to focus on the topic for today, which is ascription of intelligence. Ascription of intelligence. Ascription of intelligence is a term that was uh, brought forth into the scholarly literature by a scholar named Daryl Wing Su, who does a, a lot of fantastic work on the concept of racial microaggressions. And we talked about racial microaggressions a little bit in both uh, prior sessions, but racial microaggressions are the subtle snubs or slights that we do to one another that oftentimes demean or degrade or insult others. And so we recognize, again, looking at some of the conversation that we had last week, that mostly when this occurs, it occurs unconsciously. It's not like most educators are, are bad people who want to hurt children. Similarly, not like most police officers are bad people who want to hurt individuals in society. But rather, it's a function of the bias that's endemic to our culture. We have a culture that's rooted in a history of racism and a history that, is, that emanates from slavery. And unfortunately, because of those factors, we know that certain groups are brewed in certain ways. And so, uh, in looking at this, one of the different concepts that's come out of the microaggression literature is the concept of an ascription of intelligence. And this is where we assign intelligence to a person of color on the basis of their race. So, we assign that some people are viewed as being more um, academically capable. They're viewed as being inherently smart, while others are viewed as being less academically capable or inherently unintelligent. And unfortunately, based upon our history as a nation, black learners in general, and black boys and men in particular, are oftentimes framed in a way where they are assumed to be academically inferior. And this goes back to, a concept, to the set of concepts that we talked about in the very first session. Um, in that very first session, you might remember we talked about the D3 effect, distrust, which we talked about really in that first sec section, which looked at the notion of criminality and how, how oftentimes we view black boys and men through a lens of being criminals or deviants or up to no good. Disdain, where we view them through a pathologized lens that blames students, blames their families, blames their communities, uh, sees their communities and cultures as being lesser than in some way. So distrust, disdain, and then the last one is disregard. And when we're talking about disregard, we're specifically talking about disregarding their academic intelligence, their capabilities, their abilities in general. It's a way of oftentimes viewing them through this um, academically inferior lens. And so the D3 effect is certainly in play when we're talking about a description of intelligence. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a, a screenshot of one of the first studies that I ever conducted. And this was a study that was published in an International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, but it's actually based upon my dissertation work. And in my dissertation, what I did is I interviewed black men who were in a community college. I interviewed 28 of them and asked them to tell me about their experiences in school. And in particular, what I wanted to know is what are the factors that influence your success in college? A pretty simple study sitting down with them and saying, hey, what is it that influences your success? And many of the men in the study talked about this notion that they weren't necessarily engaged in the classroom. And so I wanted to know, okay, so what, what does that look like, you know, and, and why does that occur? 
And so as part of my conversations with them, some of the things that I learned were very disheartening. First, I learned that if a professor asks a student, hey, do you have any questions about the material? There may be a student, a black male, who's sitting in that class who knows that they need to ask a question, but won't do so. And let's say that, you know, I'm the professor, I am the professor of this course, but I'm the professor of this course, and I just went over all this information, and now I ask a question to students based upon the information to basically look at the ability to which they were, you know, have been able to obtain the knowledge. And there's a student who's sitting in the class who knows the answer. And one of the things that they would say is that oftentimes they might know the answer, but they don't say anything. And then oftentimes they would also say that, hey, sometimes the professor will say, if you need some support, come and see me during my office hours. And they would say, I knew I need to go, but I want to go. And so I, I was looking at these patterns. I'm like, well, why is that? Why wouldn't you do that? And what they talked about is that they were worried about being perceived as dumb, as ignorant, and as stupid. That they were absolutely terrified of this to the point where they were apprehensive to engage in the classroom. And this gets down to a concept of, by Claude Steele, which looks at the concept of stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is when there are certain stereotypes about racial ethnic groups, in particular when we're talking about learning contexts, um, we're thinking about black learners and Latino learners and other learners of color, there's oftentimes a stereotype that they are academically inferior. And so what they were worried about is basically engaging in the classroom in a way that would essentially reaffirm those stereotypes. And so stereotype threat is this worry that they have oftentimes that, hey, if I do these things, I'm going to be, I might make a mistake and only reaffirm these negative views that individuals have of my group and my community. Here are some examples that we see in the work that we do, and these are based upon quotes um, from uh, a, lot, a lot of this is from the research that I've done with Dr. Harris. Uh, some of it is with the research that I've done with my wife, Idara Essien. Um, and I should say that Dr. Harris helped me a lot with preparing this information for today, so I want to um, give him his, his due credit for that. So here's just a couple examples. This one, first one's from Daryl Wing Su, saying to a student, wow, you're so articulate. But it's not just the fact that it's said, but really it's a connotation that there's a sense of surprise that the student was actually articulate. Uh, here's another example that comes from our work on, on men of color in community colleges. This is a calculus class. Are you sure you're in the right place? What this quote came from is a student who was talking about on the first day of class, they showed up to class, and they, the faculty member saw them, a well-meaning faculty member wanting to help a student thought, oh wait, they look like they might be out of place. And so asked them, are, are you sure this is the right class? Because their goal was to help the student. But, but their goal was based upon this fact that they assumed that the student was academically inferior and essentially wouldn't be able to be in that class or wouldn't even be expected to be sitting in there. Here's another one. There will be times when I've answered a question and then get a response like, wow, I didn't expect you to know that. Here's another example. My son's pre-K teacher uh, called to say that he was a great student and was surprised he was so well-spoken. And so this is a, a quote from a parent. We didn't, we didn't change the, around the wording or anything, as you can see, but it's this connotation that it oftentimes takes place. And this is from one of the studies I've done with um, my wife. Um, here's what we know, looking at an description of intelligence, that oftentimes there can be a sense of surprise when boys and men of color are intelligent a sense that, wow, I really did not expect them to know that. Conveying that surprise can be very damaging and very hurtful. Most educators oftentimes don't realize that they're doing so because they're not aware of that unconscious bias. But it's important to recognize that. Next is avoidance of collaborative group work. So one of the, uh, of the themes that we find in the work that we do is that when a faculty member is in their classroom and they have students and let's say the students are, are in the class and the, and the faculty has decided, okay, I'm gonna have them break up and do some group work. And so I do this as a faculty sometimes, I'll say, okay, just collect with the people who, who are around you or make up your own groups and in groups of three or four and we're gonna work on whatever it might be. Well, one of the things that we found is that when they do that, oftentimes our men of color are the last to be picked or in many cases, they're simply not picked at all. And this is done in a way that communicates from other students to them that they were viewed as being academically inferior and someone that, this, that the others didn't necessarily want to work with. Or if they actually do work with them, it's with a sense of reluctance, maybe an eye roll, 
um, that's based upon, again, these embedded notions about what we think about academic intelligence for this population. Viewing breakdowns and performance from a disorder-based lens. It's not uncommon to, to see that educators sometimes will see a man of color who's not doing well in the classroom, or a boy of color who's not doing well in the classroom, and then to rationalize that through a disorder-based lens, that there must be something wrong with them. There must be something that's not right. Maybe there's some sort of impairment. Maybe they're not processing the information right. And so the natural response for many educators is to refer them to special education uh, to get services that oftentimes they do not need. Now, special education is a very important service for those who need it, but if you don't, it's not necessarily what we want to see for our boys of color. And then the next you can see second guessing excellence when it occurs. And I mentioned this in, the, in, the, in a prior session, but I think it's important to talk about is what happens when we have low expectations for our boys and men of color, and then they outperform those low expectations. The screenshot on the bottom of your screen is from a piece that we did in HuffPost called Too Smart to Succeed, Too Good to Win, The Plight of Black Professionals and Students. And essentially what the article talks about is this notion that many of the men of color um, who we've done interviews have talked about, hey, if I outperform low expectations, they'll think that I've cheated or that I've done something wrong. And a quote that I showed before is here. English has always been my favorite subject and I've always really enjoyed writing. In my English comp class, we had to write a 10 page essay on a social issue. I wrote mine in police brutality and the professor accused me of plagiarism. When he was handing back the papers, there was a note of mine that said, please come and see me in my office. So there was no grade on the paper, so I figured something was up. When I went to see him, he asked, who wrote this paper? I told him I did. He said he didn't believe me because the way I spoke didn't match the writing and the paper. I told him I always enjoyed writing and was really good at it. He said he still didn't believe me, but since he didn't have proof, he would let me go this time, but that I better be careful. Another example that we see is students who are, uh, or is educators who are slow to acknowledge praise, to acknowledge and praise our boys of color. So let's say that they do well, and this is some of the work that I've actually done uh, with my wife. It's a, a part of a larger study that we're doing uh, that looks at microaggressions in early childhood education. Um, and this is actually from uh, uh, one of the joint papers that we've done, she's done several that are, that are, um, that are uh, single author papers, but here's one that uh, basically some quotes about how this plays out. And this is again, this is from early childhood education, these quotes. My son had the highest academic um, report score in second grade. At the award ceremony, the other classes teacher gave awards to the white students who had the highest. Yet my son was skipped in getting an award, a reward. Here's another one. My son's second grade teacher did not want to acknowledge the fact that my son was the smartest in her class. Each quarter, students were rewarded based on their achievements on what grades students made. She made sure to give out the white children awards with pride and smiles on her face, even gave each one a little speech on how great they were. Only my black child name was just called with no excitement and just handed his award with no words. Think about how detrimental that could be. So I want to conclude my remarks and before we go over to our guest speakers with some recommendations. And now moving forward, every single uh, session will be beginning with recommendations just like this about what we can do in terms of taking this course content and applying it. But I also want to address the fact because there's been some questions about how, how come we haven't given recommendations as of yet. And the reason we haven't is very simple. And that's that we have to cover some base information so that we don't give people recommendations and then have them go and unintentionally do more damage, not recognizing some of the context. So let's think about some of the topics that we've talked about so far. We've talked about unconscious bias. We've talked about microaggression. We've talked about masculinity and a number of other topics, right? So we talked about these things which are important for us to keep in mind. And this is contextual. So let me give you an example of how things can play out bad. 
we believe that relationships are foundational precondition to effective teaching and learning, counseling, advising, or any support practice for this population. In other words, it doesn't matter how good you teach, how well put together your syllabus is, how well put together your notes are, um, how well you prepared for your class, um, your counseling practice, none of that matters unless you have a relationship with students because you simply won't be as successful and maximize the experience in the way that you could if you don't have a relationship with them. A relationship that's typified by those conditions, trust, mutual respect, and authentic care. And oftentimes the conveying of those things requires us to have an understanding of unconscious bias, microaggressions, and masculinity. So a educator, for example, participated in one of the training sessions that myself and Dr. Harris did on a campus. They didn't get the full picture of all these topics. All they got were some practices. And one of the practices that we said was, hey, if you see men of color outside a classroom, go have interactions with them, engage them, because that's going to create a greater sense of longing for them on campus. So a well-meaning educator said, okay, I'm going to do that. And they saw a man of color on campus, a black male. They walked up to him to have some sort of exchange, to give him some words. And thinking, okay, I have to relate in somehow, said to them, so how's the season going? That was their way of relating to them, right? Not recognizing that one, this person wasn't a student athlete, and two, even if they were, that wouldn't necessarily be the way that you start a conversation with a person who's a student. So that's why we've been covering these things before because without context, the recommendations can actually be more damaging than good. So with that context, here's a couple uh, recommendations. We're gonna give you five recommendations and, and then go to our guest speakers. And what we're saying is these are evidence-based practices for supporting black male success. And these practices come from a few different areas. One is from the guidebook that I did uh, with Frank Harris III and Khalid White uh, called Teaching Men of Color in the Community College. And then is, another is from a guidebook that I've done with uh, Dr. Harris that's focused on teaching boys and young men of color and from some other areas. And we're referring to this as Black Minds Pedagogy. So recommendation number one, in terms of how do we recognize that if there's an ascription of intelligence, we need to then proactively engage teaching strategies, practices that counter message that, that essentially convey that we believe that you are brilliant, that you are capable, that you are worthwhile, right? So if there is an ascription that they're lesser than in terms of the academic context, our role as educators is to do the exact opposite, to create environments, to create teaching and relational practices that convey that they do have the ability to do it. So the first practice is what we're referring to as culturally commending pedagogy. So this is like culturally relevant pedagogy, but there's an additional component to it. First, it's ensuring that the curriculum is relevant to the lived social cultural experiences of students while proactively affirming the brilliance of black minds. Let me say this, it is not enough to be culturally relevant or culturally responsive or culturally appropriate or culturally affirming. That is simply not enough with this population. Because I can pull out all kinds of different examples that might relate to you and how you perceive your community and more importantly, how others perceive your community, right? But if I'm not doing it in a way that allows you to see yourself as someone who can be academically successful, that counter messages against those stereotypes, then it's not really maximizing the benefit of cultural relevance. So some practices for that. Embedding the, the teaching practice in the historical and contemporary, contemporary contributions of people of color. So what does that mean? That means that there are incredible contributions that black peoples have done throughout history to the development of knowledge. We have scientists, we have technologists, we have uh, theologians, we have philosophers, we have individuals who have advanced society in many ways. A powerful commending pedagogy takes those examples and brings them front and center to the classroom. You can do that from a historical context. You can also do that from a contemporary context. Look at people who are doing great work in science, great work in education, great work in different fields, 
and bring those in as, as examples in the classroom so that students can see themselves in their communities and what they're learning. And again, it's not just enough to pull examples, but examples that will affirm the brilliance of black minds. In addition, honoring diverse knowledge traditions. It is not uncommon for information in classrooms to be, pre to be presented in a very myopic perspective. This is what this person said. This is what this person said. It's canon in our field. This is what we teach everybody. And what that does when we have that approach is it really doesn't allow us to recognize that knowledge has been created by numerous communities and that black peoples and brown peoples and peoples of color have contributed to that knowledge. We have to bring, bring that in and show how it's not necessarily just one perspective, but multiple perspectives. Diversification of guest speakers, lecturers, and presenters. One of the things that we know, and Dr. Harris talked about it, is that the vast majority of K-12 teachers are white women who, for many, and some at least, do a very good job with our students. But there's also some that don't. Beyond that, if you're a child of color, a male of color, and you're sitting in the classroom, and you never see someone who looks like you in the front of the classroom, the structure of power in that environment is one that is both white and feminine, two identities that you may not ascribe to. So as a result, we see by fourth, fifth, sixth grade that boys of color begin to have a disassociation with school. They begin to disassociate with school, thinking that it's not for them. So what happens? How can we change that? Well, if we can't change the people who are in front of the classroom, right, without much more labor-intensive work, and by the way, we have to diversify our teaching ranks, both in schools, colleges, and universities. So it's not to say that. But in the meantime, what educators can do who are not black is bring in examples of people who can come and talk to the students in front of the classroom and who can talk about the concepts that they're learning and say, hey, as a business person, this is how I employ that concept in my daily practice. So guest speaker, speakers, lecturers, and presenters who are from diverse communities. It's a great way of bringing diversity into the classroom so they can have visible role models of what they might be able to be. Here's some common pitfalls that we see in the integration and use of culturally relevant teaching that you might want to avoid. First, it might be culturally relevant, but it also might be mismessaged. It's not enough to have a book that's written by an author of color or to even have stories about uh, uh, black people. That's not enough because if it's a story that only serves to reinforce the distrust, disdain, and disregard that's commonly portrayed about the community, then you're actually not helping uh, the community. The best thing to do is to then use resources that help to extol, again, the brilliance and contribution of black minds. Anyways, and you might find this out, I learned this from uh, Dr. Ford who will be speaking in the class, the vast majority of books that are written by black, by, uh, about black children, black children's books, are not actually written by black authors. So, in fact, 75% aren't. So if the vast majority of those books aren't really written from that emic perspective, are they really culturally relevant? I don't think so. Simplistic applications. It's not simply enough to change a word problem from John to Juan, or John to Tyrone, or John to Tyrese, right? To say, hey, I'm just gonna change the name and that's gonna be culturally relevant. That's not enough. And I've seen that as a practice in some places by, again, well-intentioned educators, but it's not getting at the depth of how deep we need to go. It's about changing the examples in those word problems. It's about redefining how we even view this, the, our role in education. Myopic depictions. Oftentimes, if we're talking about cultural relevance, the way that well-meaning educators bring cultural relevance into the classroom is through examples that prioritize, prioritize slavery and the civil rights movement. Gosh, those two events, and it seems like black history falls within the, those two categories and nothing falls outside of it. That's not enough. In fact, I would argue that we need to de-emphasize those and prioritize other contributions of our people. Next one is validating messages. Communicating high expectations about students' academic abilities and aptitudes. Validating messages, students have to hear these messages to believe that they can succeed. 
So you have to say to them, you can succeed. Excellent work. I'm proud of you. And here's the thing that we know. Uh, in our work with community college men of color, we found that oftentimes they don't receive these messages from their actual faculty. They're more likely to receive it from other individuals. In fact, we did a study where we asked men of color about their engagement with faculty members outside the classroom. And one of the things they said is that, hey, I don't really talk with my faculty. If my faculty member sees me, right, they put their head down, they pretend to get on the phone, they walk the other direction to avoid interactions with me. So as a follow-up, we asked them, well then, who is it that you do engage with? Who is it who, who tells you important messages of validation? And they said, you know what? The people who tell me you can do it, you belong here, you can succeed, I'm proud of you, keep your heads in the books, pr keep going, young man. It's the janitor, the custodian, the food service worker, the person who is doing those types of roles on our campuses. So we have to radically reconsider what we mean by an educator. Here's another thing that I think is important as part of this. We have to validate both their effort and their ability. Now, I will say that this is a departure from some of the work uh, that you might be familiar with from Carol Dweck in her concept of growth mindset. And here's what she says. She says, we can praise wisely, not praising intelligence or talent. That has failed, don't do that anymore. But praising the process that, that kids engage in, their effort, their strategy, their focus, their perseverance, their improvement, this process, pra this process praise creates kids who are hardy and resilient. I don't wanna say that her work is wrong, but I do wanna say that it's incomplete when we're talking about boys and men of color. Yes, we need to praise their effort and ability, but if you come from a community where you've never received messages like that from faculty members and teachers and educators, it's important at some point to be able to hear, you know what, you have the ability to do this. I believe in your ability to do this. And in our work on community college men of color, it's one of the strongest predictors, that aspect of validation of all the non-cognitive outcomes that we look at, their confidence in their, um, academic abilities, their perceptions of the usefulness of color, college, their intrinsic interest in what they're learning. All of those different factors are oftentimes predicted by simple messages such as that. So again, it's not that she's wrong, it's that it's incomplete when we're talking about our communities of color. We have to praise both effort and ability. Even more so, when we praise students, it's better that it's task specific and tangible. It's one thing to say, hey, proud of you, keep going, you know, keep your heads in the books, you're doing a great job. It's another thing to say, hey, you wrote this paper, this is a, a, a fantastic example of what people should be doing. Would you mind if I showed this to the class and read it aloud in class so they can see what others are doing? That's the kind of tangible, task-specific uh, validation that our men and boys of color need. But I will say this, and this is important to keep in mind, validation for communities that have oftentimes not received that validation may be viewed at first with apprehension. What you will find is that when you validate a man of color, a boy of color, who has never really received that kind of encouragement, their initial reaction is to push back. It's to think, where are they going with this? Are they trying to con me? Are they trying to get over on me? What is the angle? And it's only through the persistence and authenticity of that message that we can actually break through that barrier and reach them. So I've had educators say to me, you know what, I validated a student, it didn't work. That's not enough. It takes continuous validation. And not just that, but they have to know that you truly believe that they can do it. Next thing, mere artifacts. Exposing students to racially salient images that highlight their contributions to a society. In reading education, there's a concept called window books and mirror books. Window books and mirror books. A window book is a book where you're looking through the window into someone else's life and experiences, to characters that you can't identify and stories that aren't relevant to you. That's a window book. And too often, our boys of color are exposed to books that are window books. 
What we want are books that are mirror books. Mirror books, what's a mirror do? You see your reflection in that mirror. You see yourself in the stories, you see yourself in the characters. So we took that concept and decided to test it in some of the work that I'm doing with a colleague here named Dr. Wendy Bracken. And what we thought is, okay, so if window books and mirror books are important, what about window classrooms and mirror classrooms? How might that affect students' test performance? And so our theory was simple. If we had classrooms where there were artifacts that were representative of racially salient images for our students of color, that they would do better. They would have intermediate outcomes where they would have higher self-esteem, higher confidence in their abilities, a greater uh, sense of belonging, a greater sense of resilience, and that would reduce their stereotype threat, their stress, their anxiety, and their depression, and ultimately it would lead to student success. So what we did is this. And we did, I've done it in a couple different ways. So the first way that we've done it is we've had students go into a classroom, not, and in that room, there were images on the wall that were racially salient images, and then we had them take tests. Black students seen racially salient images from their communities. So we've done it that way, and we also have done it with online testing. Let me just tell you a little bit about what we found with one of our studies on online testing, where essentially the banners were racially salient images, and we had black students who were broken up into two groups. Those who were in the first group who received no images, and those who were in the second group who received images, right? And they received the intervention. And this is what we found. When they were in this group where they received the images, that their stereotype threat, their worry about reifying stereotypes about their group went down drastically, what we would refer to as a large effect size. We also found that their anxiety also went down for those who are part of that group. Now, beyond that, we did another study and we said, okay, so we know this is beneficial for black students, but what happens when we look at other students, when they're exposed to these same images? And so what we did is we had three different groups, black, Latino, and white. And in that study, we were looking at self-efficacy, essentially their confidence and their academic abilities. And what we found is this again is the group that receives the racially salient images that for black students, their confidence in their abilities shot up if they were exposed to those images. We found also that for our Latino brothers and sisters, that when they were exposed to those same images, it didn't make a difference. They neither had higher scores nor lower, score, lower scores, which we were hoping that there would actually be, be some benefit there, but there wasn't, and so that's research. Here's the pattern that we found for white students when they're exposed to those same images. And so when they saw those images, their confidence in their, uh, their academic abilities was decreased. Now, we didn't have a large sample size, and so we didn't show a lot of significance with it, but it was a very clear pattern and, a very, and what we call a disordinal um, picture that we were looking at in terms of the mean plot. So, Taking this in mind, it then makes me think about what happens when it's the other direction. When you're constantly on campuses, in schools, in colleges, where the images on the wall don't reflect you or your community. When you walk down and you sit down in the cafeteria and it's an image of a white student studying. In fact, I think about the faculty and staff club at, at, that, that's at this campus. It's a wonderful in, uh, establishment, has great pictures on the walls. But a lot of those pictures are images of white students who are studying. And the only two images in there of African-American students are students who are what? Student athletes. Let's think about that built environment. Getting closer, almost there now, and I'll go through these a little quicker because we have to get to our guest speakers. Leadership opportunities. It's important to provide our students with leadership opportunities. These opportunities should, center, should provide them with opportunities opportunities to be center stage in an environment where they are usually backstage. And so what we need, want to do is center boys of, and men of color and the power structure of the classroom. So remember, as Dr. Harris had, had talked about, 
they oftentimes will grow to perceive school as a feminine domain because they don't see images of themselves in that power structure in the classroom. We can, to some degree, help to change that by providing them with opportunities to be leaders in the classroom, to be leadership, have leadership on projects, group discussions, debates, classroom senate, determining assignments. I can't tell you how oftentimes I will find that a, a classroom, a teacher will have a class in it and they'll, and they'll identify two students or three students in the class that are the leaders for the class. Do we think of our black males as being those leaders? Maybe not. Is it purposeful? Probably not. Is it unconscious bias? Absolutely. We have to then decenter that and recenter them in that environment. Here's an example from what one teacher said in a study that we did, providing leadership opportunities where students of color serve in leadership roles with projects. They will rise to the task at hand and do amazing work compared to when they are not in leadership roles. It's important to keep in mind. We found in a, in a study that we did looking at this, it increases their confidence in their academic ability, promotes their engagement, fosters a sense of belonging, and leads to higher quality work. Okay, last one. We can also engage in practices that convey high expectations. Now, here's the thing. This is what I'll find a lot of educators will tell me. I have high expectations for my students, and that may be true. But it doesn't matter unless you say it verbally, unless you communi communicate it in the words that come out of your mouth, and then those words are backed up by actions that support it, both actions that are, 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 that are showing that you believe in that, affirming black minds. And so one of the things that we, we think about is this concept that's called challenge and, and support. And this is a concept that's from the, the 1960s. And, and basically, it was created by a scholar who wanted to say, okay, so what does it take for a student to be successful? Well, they have to have challenge. And he said they have to have support, challenge, to be provided with, with learning experiences that push you to that next level of learning within your zone of proximal development, that push you to a higher standard. And that you can't just challenge a student, that you have to then provide them with support. Support can be think, thought about as the, the availability of support. Let's say I'm a, a college faculty member, having office hours, having times where students can come see me being available to meet with them, to provide them with what they need. When we are talking about our boys and our men of color, challenge and support is not enough. It must be adjoined with two different concepts. First, high expectations. Let me say this, no one has ever risen to low expectations. You have to convey high expectations that you believe in their ability to succeed. And you have to say it. In addition, you also have to have authentic care. Authentic care, again, is that notion of vested interest where the, if they do well, they're going to know like you personally felt like you did well. And if they don't do well, that you're going to be personally feel like you did it as well. That there is a shared or linked investment. And so we believe that high expectations, authentic care, has to be met with challenge and support, the combination of what of those four things lead to student success. Here's a couple quick ways that you can do that. Structure success early on. Structure your class so that the work that's done early on in the class provides students with a, an ability to be able to show that, you know what, I can do this work, right, that's accessible in that way, where they're learning some basic concepts and applying it. Structure success early on. And then as a course proceeds, you can gradually get harder so that the overall distribution of rigor in the course hasn't changed. Now, here's the thing. Rigor should never be sacrificed. One of the things that, one of the things that we find, in fact, uh, uh, my wife found this in a study that she's doing looking at early childhood, is that when educators would basically come to this conclusion that they weren't capable, they would stop challenging the students. They would stop sending work home for them because they just didn't believe in their ability to do it. We have to have that rigor. Again, no one ever rises to low expectations. And lastly, we have, to be proactively, we have to proactively check in when students have missed the mark. If a student doesn't do well, if they don't do what we know that they're capable of, we need to say that to them. And say it in a way that we're not trying to demean them, not trying to hurt them, but I know you can do better. I've seen your work. It's a way of not just 
conveying high expectations, but also, again, going back to the concept of care, showing that we truly care. Okay, so with that in mind, those are some recommendations. It's time to turn it over to our guest speakers. Dr. Okay, per perfect. is a professor and endowed chair in educational leadership and counseling and founding executive director of the Minority Achievement, Creativity, and High Ability Mock Free Center at Prairie View A&M University. He is formerly the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Endowed Chair in Education in the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers University and an esteemed expert in the field of diversity and education. Prior to joining Rutgers, he was a professor of higher education and dean of faculties at Texas A&M University College Station. He earned a BA in chemistry from the University of North Texas, an MS in education and curriculum instruction from Baylor University, and an EDD in higher education administration and college teaching from the University of Arkansas. Dr. Bonner has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the American Association for Higher Education Black Caucus Dissertation Award and the Le Education Leadership, Counseling, and Foundations Dissertation of the Year Award from the University of Arkansas College Station. His work has been featured nationally and internationally. He is the author of the recently released book, Building on Resilience, Models and Frameworks of Black Male Success Across the P20 Pipeline. Dr. Bonner, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation, Dr. Wood. I appreciate it. And it's so ex I'm so excited to be here. Um, really um, a good opportunity to talk about some of the research that I'm doing, some of the work that I've been doing, and um, to be able to uh, showcase what I'm doing in this forum is real, really impactful and really means a lot. So I just appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. So with that said, I am going to uh, delve in, and tonight's topic is Building on Resilience, Models and Frameworks of Black Male Success Across the P20 Pipeline. And that is um, one of my more recent books. And how that book came about is so many of my colleagues, including um, scholars in uh, K-12 and higher education, Many were um, engaging in um, research and work dealing with black male populations. And I would find that many of the uh, scholars and researchers, they, um, they would delve into this work and they didn't have like a um, scholarly or research foundation. So what I wanted to do was to pull together a compendium of research, uh, best practices, and point them in the direction of where they needed to go by way of black male research. And I wanted all that in one volume. So building on resilience is that compendium. It allows um, scholars, researchers, teachers, parents, community members to go to one volume, pull it down from the shelf and see what the best practices are and what the advice is from tier one scholars related to black males, particularly high achieving black males. So with that said, um, we'll move on to the next slide. And basically in this video, what Dr. Proctor is saying is that um, he inherited benefits and he inherited all these blessings that many of his buddies down the street didn't have. And because he was born into this life of benefits and blessings, um, he started life beyond the scratch line, whereas many of his buddies started life beneath the scratch line. Okay, so this slide, so everyone out there, typically when I'm out engaging in um, workshops and professional development exercises with our school districts and with universities as well, I put this particular slide up there because I want people to engage and want folks, attendees, to engage in a conversation about what does it mean to be high achieving and to be academically gifted? And so what I would like for the audience to do is just take uh, about a minute, minute and a half, and look at this collage of photos. And in the photos, the question that I pose to you is, who is gifted, G-I-F-T-E-D? So just looking at this collage, who is gifted here? So I will share with you, I have, it depends on the context, it depends on the audience. 
I have gotten responses that um, the brother there with the, with the stethoscope, uh, the doctor, uh, appears to be a doctor. Of course, he's gifted. The, uh, the young man there sitting on the basketball, he's reading, and so he's already showing early signs of being gifted. And there are times, depending on the audience, um, and I see someone said all of them, absolutely. And there are times, depending on the audience, depending on who I'm talking to, the brother there who's, uh, who's sagging, or the brothers there that appear to be incarcerated or in the chain gang, sometimes I get, well, they can't be. And my narrative is, well, they absolutely all can be and manifest uh, giftedness in different ways. So typically, from that conversation, after engaging the audience, um, I will get all of them, or they will cherry pick some of them and say, well, this person is gifted, this person is not gifted. So then I tell them, I say, well, you know, when we're talking about giftedness, you really have to look at what gifted means in different contexts. And the way that I define context is three different things. So when you're looking at context, context is people, place, and situation. So giftedness is as giftedness is displayed in a particular context. So what does it mean to be gifted in an environment where, you, where you're the only person of color? Or what does it mean to be gifted in an environment where you're surrounded by people of color? What does it mean to be gifted in one field versus being gifted in another field? So it's all contextual. And many times that will send me to a conversation about Renzulli's model. Joseph Renzulli at the University of Connecticut, he has what is, what is uh, called the three ring conception of giftedness. So in his three ring conception, Renzulli says that you need a smattering of three different clusters, three different gifted clusters. And that is creativity, above average ability, and task commitment. So to be gifted, you can't just have above average, average ability, but you also have to have creativity and you have to be committed to finishing your tasks. So we'll move to the next slide. I would encourage all of you to Google SHOT Foundation. That is S-C-H-O-T-T, -T, SHOT Foundation Black Boys Report. So the SHOT Foundation, they put out a report, um, I wanna say roughly every three years. And basically this report it gives you the NAEP data, National Assessment of Education Progress. So many refer to this as the nation's report card. So it shows you how students are doing in math, um, how they're doing in reading, literacy. So the Schott Foundation, they take the temperature and look at how black males are doing across the country. And what I like about this report, what you're seeing here is a screenshot. And this particular screenshot is interactive. So you can click on each and every one of the states and it will show you how black males are doing in uh, reading, how they're doing in mathematics. And it, will, it also shows you how many black males are included in special education. Because we know in this country there's an over-inclusion of black males in special education and there's an under-inclusion of black males in gifted and talented education. So the great thing about this report is that it gives you all that information. And now when I would encourage you on the very front page of the Shot Foundation report, you will see free PDF. So click on that and download the report and it will give you the information about, um, the, uh, about black males, how they're doing in all of the states. And if you look at this particular slide, you see that the red states graduation rates below 50%, the light red states graduation rates between 50 and 59%, the, um, Oh, I got something up covering. So you have uh, 60 and 69% for the uh, light green states, and then the dark green states graduation rates over 70%. And one of the things that I want to call your attention to, if you look at the dark green states with graduation rates over 70%, you don't have a huge representation of black males in states like Maine, Vermont, North Dakota, and Arizona. The only outlier that I see here is New Jersey. And I didn't quite understand why New Jersey was an outlier until I moved to New Jersey and worked at Rutgers. And 
one of the uh, semesters I presented for the New, the New Jersey Association of Gifted and Talented, and one of the audience members said, I can tell you exactly why. We had what was called the Abbott program, and basically what we did with that program, we ensured that there was equity. What the uh, low-income schools, what minority schools received, they were given resources at the same level as the um, higher income schools. So typically, that conversation leads me to talk about the E's, equity and equality. And it is so very, very important to understand that equity and equality are different terms, different words, and they manifest, they have different meanings, and how they're operationalized in schools is totally different. So all things equal don't mean that all things are equitable. One of the classic examples you can go back to, um, I believe in going back to the same the literature, go back to the um, 1985 compendium by Jonathan Kozel, K-O-Z-O-L, Savage Inequalities. And Kozel, he looked at schools nationally and he compared low-income schools and schools um, that were poorly resourced versus schools that had better resources. And one of the classic examples, um, a tale of two cities and one of the most vivid tales is Cherry Hill, New Jersey versus East St. Louis. And Kozel talks about how, what if you gave equal resources to both of those school settings? And in the book, he showed how Cherry Hill, New Jersey, the more affluent, affluent district, they use the million dollars for things like um, technology. And again, you have to go back to 85, so a million dollars was a lot of money then. It's a lot of money now. But technology, computers, um, they added um, AP courses. But then they found that in East St. Louis, they were, they were repairing the cafeteria and repairing restrooms. So just because you give equal money doesn't mean that you're going to satisfy and create equitable situations. So, so also very critical. So as we look at this next slide, I put this particular uh, slide up there and you see in bold, uh, again from the shot report, you see here that only 47% of black males um, are reported to graduate from high school. And the second bullet point we see that, and I, the second bullet point, I put this one up there because there are many of us who are out there doing great work, great programs, great initiatives, and we need all of them. But every now and then, we get a little comfortable and we get a little bit um, self-centered by saying that, well, I have a black male initiative. I'm doing this research. I have a program. I have a right of, rights of passage program. I'm like, well, that's great. We need all of them. There's room at the table, but there's not enough. Although with all of our efforts, we see that with all the programming out there, we're still losing 1.2 million African-American males each year. So I have um, <clears throat> two of the main issues, and um, my good colleague and friend, she's going to talk a lot about this when she comes on, Dr. Donna Ford, but it is important to look at the underachievement and underrepresentation of African-American males and Hispanic males. And what I have found when, I, when I've gone through my research and my research, engagement, scholarship, I have settled on certain key indicators, certain key effects that impact how black males are doing and how that impacts their underrepresentation and gifted and talented programming. One being deficit modeling. We always focus on the deficits. We're looking at what black males are not doing. We're saying that they're not being successful. We're looking at their underachievement. How can we focus on the assets? What about those black males who are academically talented, those who are academically gifted? So everything about my research, I have always looked at what it means to focus on those assets. So that's why I've studied academically talented students, not negating and not ignoring the fact that we have students who are academically struggling, but we need to focus on those who are achieving some of the time. So deficit modeling is a problem. Definitions gone awry. How do, we, how do we define giftedness? And I shared with you before, Joseph Renzulli says that it's three different things, three different clusters. It's above average ability, but the story doesn't stop there. It is also creativity, and it's also task commitment. Another theorist, um, I had the um, 
benefit of working very early on when I finished my doctoral program, I was a postdoc uh, for Robert Sternberg um, in his center there at Yale University. And one of uh, his theories, um, the triarchic theory, he says that giftedness is three different things. There is a analytical type of giftedness, that person who can do well on the SAT, the ACT, who gets good grades. So that very traditional form of giftedness we think about, high grades. But beyond analytical giftedness, there is a creative giftedness, the person who can like make something from nothing. That person who can have, I always use the example, you know, the grandmother or the aunt or the uh, great grandmother who can have like a jelly bean, some flour and some peanut butter and can make like a cake. <laughs> so um, there's a creative giftedness. And then finally, there is a practical giftedness, the streetwise gifted person. That person who never got a degree, who can like count money, can remember numbers, who has a very, very strong sense of stuff without having a very formal education. But they, uh, it goes to that old classic, uh, classic statement. Um, you can be as smart as you want to be, but you got to have some common sense. So I would say that third base of Sternberg's triarchy tri theory, practical giftedness is about having that common sense or those practical skills. And um, also, beyond definition, there are issues related to identity development. How black males see themselves as being gifted has a lot to do with how they identify. One of um, my colleagues and good friends is Dr. Gilman Whiting at Vanderbilt University. And check out his scholar identity model. And in that particular model, Whiting says that you are never going to get black and brown males to manifest their gifts and talents unless you first start with yourself. Do you believe that they can be gifted and talented? If you don't believe in them, how can you expect to see them? How, how do you expect them to see themselves as scholars or see themselves as being gifted? So very, very important. And then finally, generational challenges and stereotype threat. What does it mean to be gifted? What, what does it mean to be young, black, and gifted? And a lot of that has to do with generational issues. So the Generation Xer versus the um, millennial versus the boomer, versus the individual from the greatest generation. All of us have different conceptions of what it means to be smart, what it means to be achieving, what it means to be successful. And then finally, the whole notion of stereotype threat. Check out the work of uh, Steele. One of my uh, favorite books is Whistling Vivaldi. And in that book, Steele talks about how um, Gifts and talents and the manifestation of giftedness has a lot to do about how black males see themselves or how they perceive that you are perceiving them. So if they feel that they're being stereotyped, if they feel that you don't see them as a scholar or see them as being intelligent, that has everything to do with their academic potential. So um, if you don't remember anything tonight, I want you to remember this slide. Um, there are uh, what I call the big three. There are three primary reasons that black and brown males go unidentified or underidentified for gifted and talented programs. The big three are teacher referral or teacher nominations, as we call it sometimes. Number two, standardized testing uh, or poor test performance. And number three is student choice, C-H-O-I-C-E. And so, very briefly, teacher nominations, teacher referrals. Go back to the very first slide, the collage. Teachers don't know what giftedness looks like, especially for black males and brown males. They don't know what it looks like for white students. So many times the research has shown that what teachers, their ideas about phenotype and giftedness run very, very contrary to what giftedness actually is. And then poor test performance, there's a whole narrative around standardized testing, what are you actually testing? Who's being tested? And what do those tests actually mean and what are they actually measuring? Um, I always share, when you look at standardized testing, it's really not about intellect. It is about the acquisition of cultural and social capital. That's a lot of gobbledygook to basically say that those who had access to the test, those who had uh, parents who could get them in test prep courses, those who were given um, practice exams. So of course they should do better. So they had the cultural and social capital 
from parents, from grandparents, from their community to provide them with opportunities to be exposed to these tests. So, of course, they're going to do better than the student who walks into the test and the very first time they see the test is when they're taking it. And then the very last is student choice. And choice is listed there because students choose not to manifest and show their gifts and talents because to be gifted means that you are going to be isolated from your black and brown peers. So when we look at choice, students will choose or they will dumb down their potential, as the literature says. So this is Whiting's scholar identity model. And the reason I showed this, this is one of my, uh, this is one of my favorite models when I'm looking at get the students and um, especially males, one of the things that Whiting says is, is that these nine constructs each play a role and each play a part in how black males construct their identity as scholars. So we see here, and his original model is like rendered in pyramid form. So these are the different levels. So at the very base, we see self-efficacy. And from some of my own research, I found that it's very, very important to look at self-efficacy and self-esteem. So the literature shows what we need to be concerned with is self-efficacy. When we say that um, black males have lower self-esteem, the literature actually shows that's not true. Black males and black females typically have higher self-esteem than their white counterparts. And the reason I say that when you look at the literature is how we define it. So I base my self-esteem on my peer group or others who look like me. So as a black male, my self-esteem is based on my comparison to other black males. So when I compare myself to other black males, I feel great. I think I'm doing pretty good. I think I'm pretty smart. I think I look good. I think I smell good. I think I am good. So however, self-efficacy, when you define self-efficacy, that is a comparison against not your peers. That's a comparison against the other, O-T-H-E-R. So now I'm comparing myself to white males, uh, white females, Hispanic males, Hispanic females. So my self-efficacy might not be as high. So what Whiting is saying that you have to have black males look at themselves in comparison to their peers who are outside of their cultural peer group to see themselves as being okay, to see themselves as being scholars. Future orientation. What do you see for your life? What can you imagine for your life? What can you imagine about success? What does success and what does achievement mean? And I won't talk about all of these, but when we go all the way to the very, very top, the whole notion of masculinity, it is really, really critical to look at what it means to be black and male and gifted. So the whole notion of masculinity. So do we see being male as being at odds with being academically gifted and academically talented. So can my masculinity fit into the same box with my intelligence? Do I have to truncate my masculinity to be smart or do I have to truncate my smartness to be masculine? So those are things that we have to truly understand that these black males are dealing with. And one in particular, I do want to talk about my favorite construct. Typically when I'm out giving workshops and talks, I have folks to list their top three. Which of these constructs has the most has has the um, most impact on your life as a scholar? So I would say for me, the need for achievement has to be greater than the need for affiliation. I say that all of you out there have dealt with this at one point in time. Basically, that is saying in layperson's terms, the need to be successful, the need to be a the need to be intelligent has to be greater than your need to be liked. And at a certain point in time, all of us have, deal, have dealt with that. You know, I don't want to show that I'm smart because my friends are not going to like me. So when we think about black males, we have to show them that it is okay to be smart. And being smart is not at odds with, you know, being liked by your peers, liked by your friends. They have to be able to accept that identity that you hold both of those spaces at the same time. And also look at the model it is an impact, it's impacted by the family, by your mentor, by your community, and by your school. Okay, so this is the Building on Resilience book. So my talk tonight is all centered on this particular compendium. And I would encourage all of you, if you have an opportunity, 
If you have a black male initiative, black male program, if you want to know more about black males, what's going on, there is something, I mean, um, all the scholars, all the major hitters are, are here and in one place. Um, open letter um, by Dr. Otis Moss, he kind of opens the uh, book and he talks about how we have to move away from our deficit thinking and how we have to um, how we look at policymakers, curriculum, and educators and find new models and new ways of looking at our black males and their success. Next slide. The forward was completed by Tim King. So those of you know that about know about urban prep in Chicago. And um, he uh, basically uh, talks about the whole notion of moving past those deficit-minded approaches and mindsets. So um, next slide. And this odd fellow, he is talking about <laughs> how uh, we have to look at black males as not just being agents because you act on an agent, but black males have agency. So someone with agency, they can act in their own uh, realm and they can act for themselves. So it's important to see them as having agency, as bringing something to the table. Yes, uh, chapter one, Dr. Um, Sharon Chadwell, she talks about the uh, social cognitive theory and she says part of our problem is we have these, these containers, these images that we place black males into. And she says that the images of the black male being the super athlete, the criminal or gangster or being the hypersex male, because we have these stereotypes, we lock these black males into these notions and these ideas and these images that we can't move past when we try to think about them as scholars. So this slide, this, this particular chapter, chapter two, is actually one of my favorite in the book, my colleague, Dr. Richard Milner. So if for any other reason, get this book and put it in the hands of a teacher and have them to read chapter two. Chapter two is about teaching teachers about racism, about race and racism. So until we get teachers to move past notions of colorblindness and move past notions of not being responsive to students of color, we will always have these gaps in achievement, underachievement, and underidentification. Chapter four is Donna Ford. She talks about the achievement gap, and Donna says that, and she'll be on later to talk about this, there are several gaps, opportunity gaps, experience gaps, language gaps, technology gaps, so forth and so on. Gilman Whiting, I've talked about him, scholar identity model, and what Whiting is saying is that we have to look at students and believe that they are capable, intelligent. We're, we all, we're always looking at deficits and looking at seeing students as being broken. He's, he's like, look at students as being scholars and having this scholarly identity. And his model is actually uh, listed in the book, and he gives a very, very good uh, rundown of how it can be applied in practical terms. And that's another thing. You see these chapters, you see in the research, and this is a very, very short, truncated uh, overview, but in each one of the chapters, I had, I had the authors to, you have to give a visual of your model and tell how it can work for parents, teachers, and administrators. Chapter seven, this is my model, and my research is based on, I had a grant with the National Science Foundation, and what I found is that these are the factors that most influence high achieving black males in STEM and um, in PWI and HBCU context. Relationships with faculty, peer relationships, family, factors, uh, this factors influence in college selection is really choice, self-perception, and the institutional environment. The last chapter is by my good friend Derek Gregg, and he looks at gifted black scholar athletes. And as he says, scholar ballers, what does it mean to be smart and to be an athlete? This slide is the uh, grant that I had uh, with NSF. We actually went out to all of the um, HBCUs in the country and looked at what it meant to be academically gifted and successful in STEM, particularly in engineering, in HBCUs. So when you get an opportunity, just Google uh, giftedblackstem.org, and it'll come up and give you more information about uh, the grant and what we did. So we are at the very end, so it, if you have any questions, and I would just say to you, um, and I promised Dr. Wood I would talk about practical applications and how it all connects. So building on resilience, I would encourage all of you, grab a copy of that book, and you will see each one of the chapters. We have... Uh, a chapter that talks about how to get parents to advocate for their gifted 
black and brown kids. And that's by Tarek Grantham. And he shares his model of how to get parents to move from being what he calls bystanders to becoming upstanders. And he gives an entire curriculum on what parents need to say, how they need to advocate, what they need to be looking for, what test scores mean. There's a chapter by Terrell Strayhorn that looks at what it means to be at the intersection of being gifted, black, and gay. There's a chapter by Derek Gregg. I mentioned uh, scholar athletes. Donna Ford is there. She talks about all the various gaps. Gilman Whiting, he talks about scholar identity. Uh, one of my former students who's a professor now at uh, Drexel, Alonzo Flowers, he has a chapter on what it means to be gifted black in STEM from backgrounds of poverty. So to be poor, gifted, and black in engineering. Um, so with that said, it is going to be very, very important to take the research and translate that research into the digestible bites that your parents can understand, that your teachers can understand, and that your administrators can understand. And if there's anything that I can do, I'm always as close as an email. And um, at Prairie View, we have launched the Mach 3 Center, and all of our research, all of our work is about advancing the uh, status of populations of color, particularly in minority-serving institutions. So if there's anything we can do uh, by way of the Mach 3 Center, and if there's anything I can do uh, by way of my research and scholarship, F.A. Bonner at pvamu.edu, reach out to me. And with that said, I thank you all, and I look forward to hearing from you. And thanks, Dr. Wood. Thank you, Dr. Bonner. We truly appreciate it. Wonderful presentation, great context. So again, thank you for the work that you're doing and for being the leader in our field. Uh, we feel truly blessed to be able to have you today. So thank you. Well, you know, I'm a Lookwood fan, so just call on me. I'll be there. <laughs> appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, at this point, we're going to go ahead and transition to Dr. Ford. So Donna Y. Ford is Professor of Education and Human Development and Cornelius Vanderbilt Endowed Chair at Vanderbilt University. She is the former 2013 Harvey Branscombe Distinguished Professor and former Betts Chair of Education and Human Development. Dr. Ford currently holds a joint appointment in the Department of Special Education and Department of Teaching and Learning. Dr. Ford has been a professor of special education at The Ohio State University an associate professor of educational psychology at the University of Virginia, and an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky. Professor Ford conducts research primarily in gifted education and multicultural urban education. Specifically, her work focuses on the achievement gap, recruiting and retaining culturally different students in gifted education, multicultural curriculum and instruction, culturally competent teacher training and development, African-American identity, African-American family involvement. She consults with school districts and educational and legal organizations on topics such as gifted education, underrepresentation, and advanced placement, multicultural urban education and counseling, and closing the achievement gap. Listen to this. Dr. Ford has written over 200 articles and book chapters. She has made over 1,000 presentations and prof at professional conferences and organizations and in school districts. She is a prolific and powerful scholar, and we are very fortunate to have her here with us today. Thank you, Dr. Ford, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Wood, thank you for having me here. Um, I have to preface my remarks um, by saying that um, too many people don't really focus on gifted education. And then when it comes to gifted students who are black, no less black males, we are given second class status. So for you to make this an important focus, um, I'm honored. Thank you. It needs to be addressed. Okay, so um, I want to say that I've written um, 12 or 13 books thus far, and the three most relevant to this very quick talk of 30 minutes would be recruiting and retaining culturally different students in gifted education, multicultural gifted education, and then reversing underachievement among gifted um, students. Um, I would be remiss if I did not at least have a few slides that honored you, Dr. Wood, and then also um, Fred, Dr. Bonner. 
So one, I want to say, yes, black minds matter. Two, I want to say gifted black minds matter. And three, clearly brilliant black males matter. So this intersectionality between being black male and gifted is critical. And this is going to be the focus of clear this focus um, for this talk, as well as um, piggybacking on what Dr. Bonner um, shared. So two more slides, and this is going to be redundant and therefore, I guess, reinforcing from what was already shared. So one is, um, Dr. Wood, I really appreciate your focus on microaggressions in particular, and specific, specifically the um, piece about ascription of intelligence. It is absolutely fundamental that this be addressed in this um, uh, talk tonight. And yes, you mentioned, con uh, I'm sorry, you mentioned unconscious bias, but I wanna say, um, I'm more concerned about conscious bias. You know, I'm not saying they're in competition, but I think unconscious bias lets people off the hook for being racist, and, but conscious bias puts them on the hook. And then you mentioned the three Ds, I think it was, and years ago, I talked about the 10 Ds. And so we are like-minded, but I am fed up with the disgust that is placed on black males, the disrespect they face, the disdain they encounter, how they are perceived as deviant, how they are perceived as dangerous, how we, they are perceived as dysfunctional, how they are perceived as demented, um, intellectually disadvantaged, behavioral disorder, how our black males, instead of being perceived as gifted, they're perceived as disabled or not twice exceptional. How starting from almost the womb, I'm thinking about Upchurch's book, Convicted in the Womb, delayed or developmentally delayed, and then how they are perceived as disadvantaged. So um, I, I think we need to broaden those three Ds to more, but of course that can be encompassed in others. I also appreciate the discussion that we have a predominantly white teaching force and no less just predominantly white, but mostly female who have, um, who are at a disconnect with um, our black males. So we have a predominantly white female teaching force and by race, there's a disconnect with our black students. And then by gender, there is a disconnect with our students. So we have to ask ourselves, where will black males find themselves in classrooms in a positive way and more? So the teaching force is not going to change anytime soon related to race and gender. We've got to do a better job and hold white female teachers and then white male administrators accountable to do what's right by our black males. I also want to say that I appreciate what you said um, about um, Ill illiteracy in the context of mirror books and mirror curriculum. There's just no question that um, black students or students of color, let me broaden it a little bit, are so unlikely to find themselves reflected in the curriculum. And then when you look at the, the unfortunate reality that, you know, so few books are about black people or black, yeah, let's just say black people. And then when you, you know, break it down and look at black males, they're even more invisible. So one of the things that um, I'm doing with Brian Wright, who is an assistant professor, soon to be an associate professor, at the University of Memphis is we are writing a book that profiles gifted black males, well, gifted black males and then black males who are successful um, because it's so rare that that happens. And so Lookout is coming. It might be a year, but we're almost done. You know, you gotta deal with production. So Brian Wright and I are trying to take on 
this challenge of this almost all white world of children's book, books, no less um, books that don't even profile black males in a positive way. So illiteracy is, you know, children or people cannot read. A literacy is they can read, but they won't. They have no reason to because books don't look like their experiences. I appreciate um, Dr. Bonner talking about the scholar identity model, which I um, have helped to co-author with Gilman Winning. So I won't proceed with that anymore, but I'm glad that was uh, mentioned. And I hope you all will look into that further. Um, so, and I feel like I'm on a, a race right now because I got 25 years packed into this and I'm trying to do it in 30 minutes. So <laughs> why does this matter? So one, um, this is not the focus of my talk, but it, the, I think the first presentation was on the prison pipeline, school to prison pipeline, but um, clearly that, can, that must be addressed, special education and suspension. Um, special education in terms of high incidence areas, and then suspension in terms of um, subjective areas. This does, without a doubt, um, contribute to the pipeline, the prison pipeline. Now, but my focus and Dr. Bonner's focus tonight, which again, I have to say, does not get much attention in the field. I believe if he and I and I just have to put this out here, Dr. Wood, if you and I were talking about special ed and suspension, there would probably be uh, hundreds more on this webinar or class. So gifted education and advanced placement, I believe and that, um, that it, and so does Dr. Bonner, contributes to the pipeline, but it's a different pipeline. It's the right pipeline which is access to college and therefore um, access to a very lucrative career um, for those who've been in gifted education. Um, so our goal, my goal is how do we desegregate gifted programs? Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. So um, it is clear and we have um, decades of data that the achievement gaps, plural, and underachievement um, are fueled by special education overrepresentation in the high incidence areas, learning disabilities, um, emotional behavior disorders are two examples, as well as intellectual disabilities, which will be the third, as well as discipline, subjective in particular, and then gifted education and advanced placement under representation. And this is what I spent my 25 years fighting. I want to um, share with you all um, a reading that I think is just critical to give you the ammunition to take on um, academic issues. And this, this chart could take an entire hour, if not more. But the bottom line is, you know, please look at the work of Barton and Coley, 2009. I hope they will update it. But please look at that work and then look at one, first of all, read it all but look at one critical factor that um, they found based on hundreds of studies examining effect sizes that contribute to the achievement gap. You know, why is it that black students, no less black males, are not doing as well as white students? And the number one reason is not what takes place in health factors, not, one takes, not, not what takes place in the home factors, and not what, but it is what takes place in terms of school, and it is um, lack of rigor, which essentially, um, at its core, is about um, how teachers, and Dr. Bonner said this, have, and so does you, Dr. Wood, have low, if not no, expectations for our Black males. 
And so they will be referred too often, unnecessarily, inequitably for um, special education, same for discipline, but their gifts and talents will not be recognized. And this is fundamental. It needs to be recognized. So I don't care, well, I do care, but whatever we say about black parents, black dads, black moms, black grandmothers, you name it. Um, yeah, it matters. That cannot be denied. But teachers really make a difference. And your stories, um, Dr. Wood, you know, that you shared in the introduction um, brought that home. So clearly don't need to reiterate that. I want, so why does it matter? Why are we here? Why did Dr. Wood say we need to have a focus on gifted ed when not just people in general, but even blacks don't even care about what's going on in gifted education? We think more about special education discipline. So I'm glad that we are bringing this to attention. Over 250,000 black students in the United States have not been identified as gifted. Black students overall represent 19% of our public schools, according to the Office for Civil Rights, but we only represent 10% of those identified as gifted. Now, in other um, years, I have disaggregated this data, and it shows that when Black students are identified, they are, mo they, I'm sorry, are most likely to be females the most invisible, disenfranchised, disadvantaged, um, and whatever else you can think of, black, um, I'm sorry, um, gifted students are black males. There are no other students in the United States, no less in the probably approximately uh, what 16,000 school districts who are denied access to gifted programs other than black males. And this is why we have to have this conversation. So of that 10%, um, at least, or I'm sorry, over half of those um, would be bla uh, black females with black males being invisible. So you have to ask yourself, and this is rhetorical. We only have an hour, I mean, 30 minutes, I'm sorry. This is rhetorical. What are those black males doing? What are they doing? Many of them are becoming behavioral problems. Many of them are underachieving. Many of them are having their gifts denied. There is no other field where black males are as disenfranchised as gifted education. And yes, I'm saying that comparative to special education, which, uh, to be quite honest, is not that special. In special education, where that's special, you see more whites in it. Keep it moving. So um, I don't have enough time, and neither did um, Dr. Bonner. You can go to um, the Davidson Institute on Gifted and find more about your state policy in terms of whether your programs um, gifted in particular are mandated and or not in the particular type of funding. But I do wanna say this, in many places where there are black people, gifted education will not be mandated and there will be no funding. Um, the reverse, in many places where there are white people, gifted programs will be mandated and there will be funding. If that doesn't get you upset, then something is not right. Um, I'm going to just have you take a screenshot. I can't go through all of this, but my, there have been many um, federal definitions of gifted. My favorite one is this one from 1993. And what I really want to highlight is that this definition um, focused on talent. It does not use the word gifted. It focused on potential, and it had the clause that we should be looking at students when compared with others of their age, which is nothing new, but what is really new, or then, 
experience and environment. And I hope I can bring that little clause home um, in a minute. I also want to say that um, the federal government recognizes five areas of giftedness, if you did not know. Intellectual, which is IQ. Most people are obsessed with an IQ of 130, and I said obsessed. And then we go to specific academic, which would be the core content area. You know, you could be gifted in math or science or language arts or social studies. The third area will be creative, which most, which some districts have in their um, definition, but don't do a thing with it. And I have a problem about that with alignment. Um, two other areas are visual and performing arts, and then leadership. Uh, again, can't go into a lot of time, but when I think about leadership, I think about some of the most brilliant black males I have worked with who somehow, and I don't mean it was by accident, but ended up being gang leaders. But you would not be in a gifted program because you were in a gang, yet you display characteristics of leadership um, in, in socially unacceptable ways. One of my favorite um, theories on or models on gifted is by Tana Mom, who talked about those five areas, but also talked about the importance of non intellective requisites, which will be your personality. He talked about environmental supports, which um, Fred Bonner, Dr. Bonner mentioned, which would be social and cultural, economic capital. And then how about chance? You just happen to be in the right place at the right time. So what I want all of those who are listening to, listening to know is um, I am by no means an advocate for this um, debate about giftedness being genetic or environmental. I prefer to just say it's both. And then even more so, I lean toward environment because none of us are God, so to speak, and we don't know what anybody is capable of. So let's just keep those expectations high. This is my story. I grew up in East Cleveland and Cleveland. Um, I, this is the house that I grew up in starting in, I think, middle school, seventh grade. And despite this, so to speak, shack, which my mother sold in 2004 when she retired and came to me and came to live with me, in Nashville, Tennessee. She sold it for 35,000, I think it was, in 2004. I want to make the argument that our zip code, no less our skin color, but definitely our zip code is not our destiny. I grew up in this house and I've surpassed many of my white colleagues who have privileges that are you can't even imagine. And so I appreciate the conversation earlier about resilience. We are some of the most resilient people you will ever meet, but that is not taken in consideration in schools. So yes, I grew up 1304 East 152nd Street, East Cleveland, Ohio. Look it up and you will see I am not making this up. And yet I end up being not just a full professor, but an endowed chair at an elite institution. So I found this quote the other day that resonated with me and it says, you might be poor, your shoes might be broken, but your mind is a palace. And that is what we have to convince our students about. In particular, that is what we have to let our black males know um, about. I want to also um, acknowledge that there is scant information on um, the combination of race and poverty. We know very little about students of color, as, uh, specifically blacks in gifted education. And we know even less about blacks 
if they live in poverty. So a shout out to Ramon Goings for thinking of this project and um, study and then um, let me chime in and it came out um, this week. So I uh, encourage you to read this study. Now, I haven't said this. I want to um, uh, also say that even when blacks don't live in poverty, we are not identified as gifted at equitable levels. So it's not just about poverty. This is about racism and gifted education. So I want to um, offer this as and not or. So my work is about what can we do to recruit black students, black males in gift education, which is about quantity. How can we desegregate gifted education? And what can we do to retain um, black males in gift education? So Dr. Wood, um, your stories, you shared a couple earlier about um, uh, teachers microaggressions let me just say that and teachers questioning did you do this work um, who helped you did you cheat that is real and I, I don't remember the date but um, maybe 2015 or 16 I wrote an article on microaggressions well actually I've written several but microaggressions in gift education and I think um, the one that might be most accessible is um, in Gifted Child Today, microaggressions in gift education. So, I mean, I'm really thanking you and uh, Fred Bonner for setting this up really well. So recruitment, what can we do in terms of quantity and desegregate gifted programs? And what can we do in terms of retention, quality, and therefore integration and yes brown versus the board of education is on my mind heart and soul so what can we do um, in terms of you know looking at gifted education and desegregating it and what can we do in terms of multicultural education slash culturally responsive education and making sure that we are doing what is right for and by students. We cannot have a colorblind perspective. And that is why I said, you know, um, earlier, gifted and not or and not but. So when we come talk about academic needs, both lenses, cognitive needs, both lenses, academic, social, psychological, cultural, both lenses. And I want you to note that I separated advanced placement because some of you may not know that gift, that advanced placement was never met. Well, gifted advanced placement is not just for gifted students. Look up the work from the college board. Advanced placement is for students who are interested in going to college, but too few schools have gifted curriculum at the high school and so therefore, unfortunately, I don't think it's right, they use advanced placement for serving gifted students. So I want to make note that what is viewed and valued as gifted in one culture may not be viewed and valued as gifted in another culture. Building on the work of Howard Gardner and Robert um, Sternberg, so I want to argue that whatever the test is, whatever the checklist is, whatever the referral form is, whatever the theory is, they were never based on blacks and no less black, black males. So therefore, we have underrepresentation and it is uh, egregious to say the least. And I'm being nice. So, Dr. Wood, this is your platform. I'm not going to cuss. I'm going to do Donna Ford. Donna Ford. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm not going to go there. Donna from Cleveland. But um, gifted education was never meant for black people. 
it was never meant for black males. Just know that. And so we have to fight, fight, fight to desegregate gifted programs. But I want to go back to something I said earlier. One of the things that breaks my heart is that too many, I didn't say all, I didn't say the majority, I didn't say most, but too many blacks don't even give a bleep about gifted programs. And so for you, Dr. Wood, to have this platform where we can, Dr. Bonner and I can share this, I, I really want to thank you. So my, my goal is to merge these two fields so that it is Donna Ford from East Cleveland is gifted and Donna Ford from East Cleveland is black. So the focus that I really am rushing to get to, I mean, I'm like almost out of breath, like I've been on a treadmill, but my focus is equity. And I want every uh, if, if any black person on this, in this course, in this webinar, does not get this, um, then I have not done justice to what is necessary. So I want to introduce an equity allowance um, and... Um, I feel like I've been talking forever. I haven't watched the clock, you guys. Please let me know, if, Dr. Wood, if I've gone over. I probably have. But I want to introduce equity formula, and if I have to, I'll just stop after this equity formula. Um, even though I know that you were talking earlier about people wanted recommendations and solutions. So um, just take a, you know, a look at this screenshot. And in particular, the third piece is what I'm focusing on that there will always be barriers, but we have to address those barriers. So there are um, four pieces that I want you to think about in terms of increasing access to um, gifted education for black males. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which I'll share the formula, a court case, McFadden, um, as you see there, a court which I was um, on behalf of the plaintiff, and we won that court case. And then um, Tucson District, which I was not part of the court case, but they used the formula, and then the state of Missouri. Um, I'm going to skip a few things and just get to the formula. And then, Dr. Wood, if you, because I'm sorry, Dr. Wood, I did not even look at when I started. So I might have to just end in a slide or two, and you'll let me know. So the formula. Yeah, take a slide or two, but we also want to have some folks ask questions too. Of you. Okay. 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 So I'm gonna I'm gonna share this and maybe one more slide, and then um, we I'll, I'll open it up. So for example, black students are 19% of our U.S. schools, um, but they're only 10% of those in gifted programs. So if you look at the bottom one, just for time. Um, it's called the 20% rule or allowance, or I'm sorry, let me back up. It's called the 20% allowance, which I call it, or it's called the 80% rule. So if black students are 19% of a district, if black students are 19% of your building, if black students are 19% of the U.S., you, you, you got to start with your baseline. Then you say 19 times 0.8 is... Um, is 15.2, so 0 0.8 times 19 or 19 times 0.8, your 80% rule is 15.2. So in the United States, black students um, should be a minimum of 15.2% um, of gifted programs based on our being 19% of gifted programs. If we do not, I'm sorry, 19% of, of school districts, if we are not 15.2% of get to programs, racism, intentional, racism, unintentional, is at work. And then, again, you can also look at it by black males, who are like 9% of all students 
um, and so invisible in gifted programs. So um, my 30 minutes, which I really want to give a shout out to Dr. Wood, want, want to give a shout out to um, Fred Bonner, Dr. Bonner, is about how to, about getting to this equity formula. I don't want, I don't even need to say anything else other than this. We have the most brilliant black males, period, who've never been um, given access to gifted programs and racism is and sexism are at work. So I, I don't have time to go into the barriers um, because I really didn't look at the clock, but I know I'm over. So I'm happy to talk about those barriers just impromptu. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for the incredible insights and for your comments. Uh, just ab absolutely powerful. Um, we were writing down some of the quotes, actually, Kron, if you could turn the, on the, this over here. Just some of the things that you were saying as you were going uh, through your presentation. Uh, you said, uh, we need to broaden the 3Ds, the 10Ds. I hadn't seen uh, that chart of you. Like, wow, we are definitely um, uh, one in thought. Uh, you talked about some of the underrepresentation of teachers uh, of color, noting that 85% of teachers are white, 75% of teachers are female. You, uh, you talked about the, the percentage of books that are, uh, that are only 3% of books being by about African Americans. And really uh, a clear theme is that we need to desegregate gifted education. So the, the just really powerful insights. So as, as always, what we're going to do is we're going to um, use the hashtag Black Minds Matter. If anybody wants to ask questions, just uh, pose them there and, and I will then relay those to um, Dr. Ford. In the meantime, as we're doing that, I just want to, to recognize a few people that, were, that either were mentioned in this session, previous sessions, or haven't been mentioned. Because you know, we, and when in doing a course like this, we can't simply bring in everyone who's doing great work in this area. And there's a lot of people who are truly committed to it. So I just wanted to acknowledge a, a few names. Uh, one that was already mentioned, um, who's, who's done work with Dr. Ford is Ramon Goings, who just does incredible work uh, focused on, uh, on diversity and black learners. Uh, Cesare Warren, who has a, a brand new book that's out and focused on, on black males. Uh, Derek Brooms, who does great work on black males. Andre Perry. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, of people who are just doing great work in this area. And so we just want to acknowledge that. And at this point, we'll turn to, to the questions. Um, so the first question is, is recommendations. As a parent, um, I have a, a child who I believe is, is gifted. Um, how do I proceed with my school in an environment where he is profiled? Uh, that's going to be so complicated and a long message. Um, I would suggest that the person who raised that question just contact me and Fred Bonner. That's because racial profiling is not going anyway, uh, going away. I'm sorry. So, um, and then go to the Office for Civil Rights website, ocrdata.ed.gov. I'll repeat that, ocrdata.ed.gov. And when you go to the school, you can have not just the district data, but you can have data to the building level and show that um, at the building, black students are not being identified. So contact me and Fred Bonner as, as well as others. Okay, so this next question comes from Stacy Teeters. And she says, uh, Dr. Ford, knowing that many of our students of color, including men of color, start their higher education at a community college, what can we do at the community college to better provide opportunities for our students to have an education with high academic rigor that fosters our gifted students and helps our students reach their highest potential? Um, so at the university level, it's going to really be really hard, which is why I had the piece about the pipeline. Um, so we get the students at a community college level, and we need them there, and they need to be there. Um, we, we, we've got to find ways to make sure that we don't penalize them for this, the um, racial injustices that exist. So, for example, 
um, if you're you're no matter what district you're in, and I'm ta- I'm not talking about across districts. I'm talking about within districts. You could be in a district that has like forty buildings, uh, and I'm thinking about AP in particular since it's about community college. You could be in a district that has forty buildings um, that are high that are, um, are high school buildings, but you will find if you do your work that there will be few, if any, AP classes in the lower income, predominantly black buildings, but there will be, there will be a lot of, of AP classes in the higher income buildings. So my, my thing is get your data, bring it, hold people accountable. And if you still think that racism is at work, contact two entities, um, Office for Civil Rights and Department um, of Justice, if you don't feel that you're, you're being listened to and your children are not being advocated for. Okay. I think we're going to take one more question because uh, we're, we're over time at this point. Um, Nis says, I'm a first-year uh, teacher. Um, what do I need to know? Um, to better, um, no, what do I need to know to avoid uh, falling into the same patterns? So as a first year teacher or as a 50 year teacher, 20 year teacher, whatever year you're in, but I'm glad, I'm glad that the person asked that question early on. One, um, and I don't know this person's demographics, but so clearly I'm, I'm always going to focus on you need to be culturally competent. And even if you're black, you need to be culturally competent. Uh, so you need to get training and get your education so that you do not have the same stereotypes and biases that have resulted in only, t- uh, in only 10% of our gifted programs nationwide having black students, which is a lot of students. So demand that, you know, your um, district provides professional development training and then if they don't then you have to be proactive and go get that training come to the national association for gifted children which is lily white and that's why i've been there for 25 years trying to desegregate it and vent go to your state gifted um organization wherever whatever state you're in and get the training to to make sure that you know how to challenge your students and that you will refer them and that you will advocate for them through an equity lens and hold leadership accountable. Two, infrequently, do Blacks even care about gifted education? So thank you, Dr. Wood, for putting this on the table. Let's not a fire and let more people know that our black boys are brilliant. Absolutely. And thank you again. You're